Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. I'm your host, Aaron Harbor, and today we're in Houston, Texas at IHS Sarah Week. Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. Today with me is the president, chairman, CEO. What other title don't you have, by the way? <laughs> uh, Sam Thomas of Chart. Chart, uh, I, I want to know a little bit more about Chart, but first of all, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure, Aaron. Thank you. Sure. Chart's a, um, an, an engineered equipment manufacturer that primarily specializes in cryogenic equipment, so the ability to store and produce gases as very cold liquids. Um, the majority of our business is either related to natural gas processing. As in liquefaction. Liquefaction. So the, that's the cryogenic application. Yes. So we're, our equipment is used to liquefy natural gas so that it can be transported. But it's also used to separate out gas components. So in natural gas processing and a number of petrochemical processes, we provide the equipment for that as well as complete process packages. Another one of our divisions provides the distribution and storage equipment to, again, transport gases as cryogenic liquids. So all of the equipment to transport by either ship, rail, truck, and store it at end-use applications is also developed by CHART. All right. Now, when most people think of cryogenic, they're, they're thinking of uh, preserving themselves for eons. What's, uh, uh, I, are you in that industry at all? We are also in that industry. We provide biological storage equipment for storing primarily stem cells or cord blood. Um, and that's something that, that is growing uh, because of all the applications of bio-related pharma, of solutions that come from stem cell development for medical therapies. So that is a significant part of our business as well. All right, so um, out of curiosity, how long can you store things like st stem cells cryogenically and, and be able to use them at uh, a high percentage rate? Certainly more than 30 years. Really? So we store at temperatures at liquid nitrogen, nitrogen temperatures, minus 170 C or minus 280F, which is below a glass transition temperature, so effectively there's no cellular activity. The challenge in research, and we've had that capability, or the industry has had that capability, for probably 40 or 50 years. The challenge is how do you freeze cells without damaging them, and how do you thaw them without damaging them. But the, the most challenging part is how do you prepare cells so that you can freeze them so that they don't have any further damage or you don't damage them during the process? And that's the area that we continue to be able to freeze um, more sophisticated cells. We don't do that research work, but we provide the equipment for people to do it. Will, we, uh, will the industry uh, have the ability at some point to freeze body parts for extended period of, of periods of time and be able to use them? Well, certainly, um, at some point, potentially complex organisms. But right now, it is routine to store um, long-term small body parts, pieces of bone, pieces of, of tissue, um, heart valves. So relatively simple um, body parts can be effectively preserved long-term and then taken to the operating theater and, and installed. All right, and of course the ultimate question uh, you know, from all of our favorite science fiction movies, what about entire human beings? Is that ever gonna happen or is that not a reality? I don't expect it in my lifetime. Do you ever expect it? I have no idea. They, they have made improvements in, in the ability, but this, this issue of effectively coming up with methods to freeze without the ice crystals causing damage to complex cells is a challenge. Pretty, pretty tough one. All right, speaking of freezing, we talk about LNG. Yeah, the, just what's happened in the liquefied natural gas arena, uh, you know, certainly Chart Industries has been involved a long time, but I mean, just several years ago, uh, the LNG focus was on you know, building import facilities. How do we bring LNG into the country to meet 
uh, energy demand, then that rapidly with the shale revolution changed to how do we build, instead of import facilities, export facilities. Now you're in a very, you're in a very low price environment, certainly with uh, natural gas and with, with oil. How does that impact uh, where LNG is going and chart industries in particular? Well, it means we have to be flexible. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a challenge because the market does change. We provide equipment that is basically sold as the use of natural gas increases globally. The challenges we've gone through in North America with the shale revolution and finding tremendous reserves of natural gas when, as you said, just back in 2004 or five time frame, we thought we didn't have enough natural gas and would have to import. So it has changed where we're selling equipment and the type of equipment we're selling. Um, it is very challenging to follow it and to grow the company. Um, like many people in the energy industry, our business has been volatile as a result. Um, so it's important that you do have the flexibility to be able to scale up or down and to take a longer view to make sure that you're prepared when new opportunities come up. Um, in general, we continue to be very bullish that the use of natural gas as the cleanest hydrocarbon fuel will be a bridge to lower carbon fuels or no carbon fuels um, and that its usage will continue to grow. But I've given up the hope that um, we'll do it in a controlled manner so that there's no cyclic, there's no cyclic uh, issues. <laughs> All right, well, that's, it's probably a much more realistic approach these days. Uh, so where do you think the industry is headed in terms of demand for LNG from the United States? I mean, before, certainly, uh, if you look just a, a few years ago, the uh, difference between uh, the price difference, uh, if you look just a few years ago, the price difference between uh, natural gas in the United States and natural gas in Asia or Europe was extraordinary. You still have a significant gradient. Seems to be closing, that gap seems to be closing. Where, where are we, where do you project that to be? And how does that impact LNG exports from the United States? Well, I think you have to recognize that in the United States, the following chenier, most contracts are being offered from the United States on a Henry Hub plus a tolling charge basis. That made them quite a bit less expensive than the rest of the world, particularly from Australia or the Middle East or Indonesia, where the contracts are oil index priced on something like the Japanese crude cocktail formula, but roughly a conversion from a barrel of oil to a um, million BTUs of LNG. Um, was stated at a 10 or 11 percent gradient. So when you have $90, $100 oil, you, that's, that implies a contract price of 11 or $12 per million BTUs. So plenty of room to operate with a significant arbitrage from North America. Where if you're looking at two or three or even $4 uh, per thousand cubic feet or per million BTU natural gas pricing here. Right in North America. Yeah, but now you have the situation that spot prices and even contract prices in Asia, delivered to Asia from the Middle East or Australia, are down to the $5 per million BTU, or currently $7, but it's a lagging price index. So if you assume that $30 oil prices hold for another six months, it means that natural gas LNG prices delivered in Asia will, will trend down to the, the $5 range. Not very competitive. Correct. So, so that's the challenge. But what we're seeing in terms of the, the people that are continuing to um, work to sign up offtake agreements to go forward with LNG export projects from the U.S. is that the end users are tending to to make their decisions based on what they expect oil prices and hence LNG prices to be in the five to 15 year time frame from now. Interesting, all right, well I wanna talk a little bit about 
the future uh, of LNG given those factors. But first, we're going to take a break. We'll be back with Sam Thomas, the president, CEO, and chairman of Chart Industries. There's more of the Aaron Harbour Show after this. The people in this industry who have been through multiple cycles um, are prepared for it. They know how to hunker down, how to take a downturn in stride, live to fight another day, work on repairing their balance sheets, and then, but also at the same time, maintain the flexibility so that they can scale up again as conditions change. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. Join me and watch the Aaron Harbor Show. 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 I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harbor Show and keep hope alive. The Aaron Harbor Show may be viewed 24 7 at no charge from any location in the world at www.harbortv.com. Welcome back. We're with Sam Thomas, the president, chairman, and CEO of Chart Industry. So, Sam, one of the things that really fascinates me uh, about the industry is uh, anybody in a commodities-based industry or one impacted by it, and especially energy, it's just the volatility of pricing. I mean, if you're building a car, uh, you might be able to sell it for $25,000 one year, or maybe you have to cut it to $22,000 the next year. This is an industry where the, the basic price of a product can go down, uh, you know, certainly the commodity aspect, you know, 75 80%. How do you deal with that kind of challenge as a business person? Well, it ages you quickly. I'm only 25 years old. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's certainly a challenge. Um, it's something that in the up markets, you, everyone, the euphoria, the, the mentality is it's going to go this way forever. It's a fundamental change and it's going to be rising forever. Hundred dollar barrel oil is here to stay. That's right. We're never going to see it below and, triple digits. And it's self reinforcing, so everybody starts to believe it. Um, in the downturns, um, the optimists say it's going to change quickly, it's going to come back. Um, and the people who have been around through multiple cycles say, well, it'll come back. When it comes back, I don't know when it is, but I'm going to be ready. And I think that's um, what you see is that the, the people in this industry who have been through multiple cycles um, are prepared for it. They know how to hunker down, how to take a downturn in stride, live to fight another day, work on repairing their balance sheets, and then, but also at the same time, maintain the flexibility so that they can scale up again as conditions change and then spend a lot of time crystal ball gazing to try and get a three month or a six month or a one year lead on everybody else. Uh, what has Chart done to protect itself? And certainly people dealing directly with certain commodities in, in the energy industry, sometimes you can hedge things. If you're an airline and you want, to, you want that stability and you're willing to accept uh, the price today, for example, you can hedge for a year or two or sometimes longer. Yeah, we don't have the, the opportunities to, to do really effective hedges other than natural hedges by spreading our risks. Um, but even in the event, the most experienced hedgers, um, it's unusual to be able to effectively hedge things for more than six or 18 months out. And you see that coming through now. Basically, you have to have the business fundamentally built to be able to handle it so that you keep a conservative balance sheet you don't have too much debt loaded up so no one can step in in a down quarter or a down year and dictate the way they think you should run the business um, so that you can or, take or, a longer term or, view. Or take over the business. Or take over the business. And then you also have the flexibility to be able to downsize. We do that by renting or leasing facilities, um, by having contract employees so that in the boom times we're able to respond to customer opportunities but in the downturns we can we can downsize and effectively hunker down and live to fight another day 
I'm, uh, I'm amazed at the, at the conditions that, uh, I mean, some businesses, for example, uh, in the oil business, uh, where a company is exploring producing oil, uh, can hedge and, and agree to sell its product uh, at a set price for a, a fairly long period of time. Of course, then if, if prices go down, they look like they're geniuses, but if prices go up, shareholders are saying, hey, how come you're selling oil at $50 a barrel and everyone else is getting 75 So, uh, But maybe that conservative element... Uh, well, it's also, you have to remember, it's, it's time-based. It's, um, you know, we, we say it's oftentimes possible to look like you're brilliant for six months. It's a lot tougher to do it for two years. <laughs> <laughs> so with, uh, with, with LNG, looking at it long-term, you're obviously bullish about the prospects, but, but what, what could go wrong long-term? Well, certainly, um, as oil prices have come down, um, we've had to examine at what price um, does natural gas compete with other fossil fuels, um, whether it's coal or oil or renewables. And um, there was an enormous opportunity at above $80 oil, above $75 oil, for natural gas being a much lower cost BTU source and being cleaner to grow very rapidly. But even absent that, at $50, we see lots of opportunities for LNG to grow, not just as a, a fuel for power plants um, or large processes, but also as a transportation fuel. But you get down to, to $30 oil or sub $30 oil, and it's really very difficult to justify the infrastructure investment necessary to convert applications over to LNG rather than to, to diesel fuel or oil-based liquid fuels. So one of the one of the most interesting aspects of the of the industry is when you look at the cost of the, the capital investment in L LNG processes. Uh, certainly, when you looked at when when the country and, and, and companies looked at the cost of creating import facilities uh, and then export facilities. I mean, those, those were you know, billion, multi-billion dollar uh, efforts. Uh, when you look at processing plants, I mean, it's easy to spend hundreds of millions of dollars, mm -hmm. uh, certainly on large scale plants. What's, what's Chart doing and what's your perspective on uh, making the whole process more affordable or, or at least not taking such large dollar risks? Well, this is an area we've put a lot of effort, and I think we've been successful. Um, we're getting a lot of market interest and market acceptance of our approach to small and mid-scale LNG. The trend over the past 30 years has gone to bigger and bigger plants to get economy of scale, both in installation and construction costs, but also in operating costs. And what we've been doing is working from a much smaller base of how can we use smaller, more modular units that can be installed at lower cost than these very large plants, done in a more staged manner over several years or a decade, rather than all at once before you can start producing revenue. Kind of a modular approach. Correct. And then finally, how do we get it so that these smaller plants actually have the same operating efficiency? They can be run for the same amount of power input to get the same amount of LNG out. And we've As come very close. About, you're talking about not losing the economies of scale that you get from the larger plants. Correct. And by a combination of those techniques of using smaller, more readily available components, whether it's compressors, gas turbines, electric motors, pumps, um, or even pipe sizes and flanges, how can we reduce the overall construction cost, number one. Number two, how can we make these smaller, simpler plants that are reliable um, achieve the same levels of efficiency? And we've done that with development of our process. And then finally, by using these smaller units, we're using the same kinds of compressors, pumps, turbines that are used in gas processing plants or in petrochemical plants, so they're produced by more suppliers, and they're produced in much higher volumes, so more cost effective. Right, off, using off the shelf essentially. So we materials. believe we're able to produce now 
a half million or one and a half million size, million tons per annum LNG facility that can be built in, in multiple trains that can achieve lower capital cost and, and nearly the same operating efficiency as a four and a half or five million ton single train facility. Right. Well, that, that should keep you competitive. All right, we're going to take our last break and we'll be back with Sam Thomas. There's more of the Aaron Harbour Show after this. The other thing that I see as the biggest leadership challenge is communicating both to employees and to, to stakeholders and customers effectively. Your opinions, ideas, suggestions, and criticisms related to guests, topics, questions, or the host are welcome. Please send an email to producer at harbortv.com. Hi, I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. For information about the program, who our upcoming guests and topics are, and ways you can participate, please go to our website. That's harbortv.com. And most of all, thanks for watching. To obtain a DVD copy of this program, please contact info at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. I'm with Sam Thomas, the President, CEO, and Chairman of Chart Industries. So, uh, Sam, let's talk about corporate leadership. You've got all these fancy titles here, President, Chairman, <laughs> CEO, um, what does it take to be a, 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 an effective, uh, I was going to say good CEO, but I guess let's start off with effective uh, corporate leader today. You need a, a broad perspective. We are a global business. We operate in a, in a global economy. And while a large part of our employees are, are U.S. based, we're truly selling to a global marketplace and we have global employees. Um, so I think it's important that as a leader, you present a balance of global perspective, not just one region's or one country's perspective in going forward. I think the other thing that I see as the biggest leadership challenge is communicating both to employees and to, to stakeholders and customers effectively. Um, that's something that I find um, I have to work hard at and I admire people who, who do that very effectively. What about compared to 20 years ago? Was it easier 20 years ago to be a, a corporate leader, do you think? How has it changed? Let's put it I don't that know. Way. I think that the, the ability to anticipate and react to, to changing developments um, with the speed of communications um, <laughs> and the dissemination of information from the internet and from television probably has put a much bigger premium on being able to react quickly and respond to changes um, in very short periods of time. When you uh, work with different corporations and uh, government agencies, secretaries of the cabinet, etc., uh, everybody has this increasingly growing number of handlers, of, of directors of communication, vice presidents of corporate communications, uh, managers of community and all that and uh, they th there seems to be this pack mentality but so many of them are afraid to put their uh, their leader their their CEO chairperson president in front of the public and talk to the public why is that well it's, it's probably a statement of the lack of confidence of, of CEOs to be good communicators <laughs> <laughs> it, it's challenging it, it's not easy um, but it's easy to, to be overmanaged. Most CEOs, most people in top leadership positions, whether they're generals or presidents or uh, whatever, they're usually the best informed people about their organization. They're usually very articulate and very thoughtful. And to me, these people consistently do a better job of explaining to the public what they're doing and, wh and what their organization is about than anyone else, yet they, they seem to be hidden from uh, the public quite a bit. Am I, am I wrong about that? Are people just afraid uh, to take a chance? Or what, Why don't we see more of these uh, people in unrehearsed public settings? The challenge, I guess, is that you, um, with the dissemination of information rapidly to a wide range of people, there's the risk that you'll um, not know your audience and say something inappropriate. Um, and I think that the good communicators get their points across without offending too many people.
but um, that's always the challenge, and and it's always the the risk management aspect of of, of putting yourself out in public. When you uh, when you think of uh, uh, effective leaders, uh, what are some of the names? Who are some of the people that come to mind? Whether it be political, military, historical, corporate, or whatever. Well, because I talked about um, the fact that that I see those communication skills and being strong communicators. I guess two presidents that I would single out as admiring them, not necessarily because I agreed with all their political views, but as being very effective communicators are Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton. I think that uh, in the modern era, they really stand out as, as people who are able to communicate um, to a, a very wide range of people and communicate ideal ideals and ideas and concepts, again, to a wide range of people. How about in the corporate world? Who would you, uh, either past or, or present, uh, anyone who really impresses you? I don't know that I would single anyone out. As, 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 you've, have you, as you indicated, there's an awful lot of, of very capable CEOs who are able to express positions and communicate very effectively. And I think that um, no matter how much effort is put into handling them and protecting them or making sure they're saying the right things, um, a big part of the reason they've risen to the position they're in is that they're able to communicate with people effectively. All right, last question. Uh, uh, whether it be globally or in the United States, if, if you could see, and, and you, could, you can uh, even have two shots at this, but if, if you could see the country uh, adopt uh, a new policy, if there were a policy change, a regulatory change, a, a law, uh, what would you like to see done what, and, and why and what kind of impact would it have? Well, I think for, the, for North America or for the United States, a more comprehensive energy policy that articulated more effectively and led us towards um, reducing global emissions. Most countries have a national energy policy. Uh, in the United States, it, it doesn't seem we have any real national energy policy or plan. We certainly don't have anything that would be considered a consensus plan. I mean, why is that and how do we get one do we, or maybe do we not need one? Well, I think if you want to achieve an objective, a specific objective, it's helpful to have a plan. <laughs> as opposed to <laughs> randomly hope? Yeah, as, as opposed to letting economic decisions and competing interests decide. Um, because clearly, as the economic situation changes, the, the drives and, and direction does change. Can we effectively have an energy policy? I don't know. We have very divergent interests. Um, a number of the largest global energy majors are U.S. based. They also have significant political influence. You're not going to develop um, a coherent U.S. energy policy without involving a wide number of parties who have very different interests. So it is a challenge. I don't know that um, over the long term I can point to any other country who's done it more effectively than the U.S. without an energy policy. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Sam, thanks so much. Thank you. Really enjoyed being with you. Okay, that you, was Aaron. Sam Thomas, the president, chairman, and CEO of Chart Industries. I'm Aaron Harbour. Thanks for watching. Please contact us. We want to hear from you. And thanks for watching.